from Midwestern speaking tonight. And uh, Tim, thank you so much for being sure, here. Sure, sure. And we'll let you get started. We have a full house. They're listening to you in the lower level awesome. as well. Thank so, you. So uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, a little bit about me. I am an associate professor at Midwestern University and um, did my PT degree at Marquette and my master's, advanced master's from Northwestern and a PhD in kinesiology from the University of Connecticut. Uh, when I was uh, at uh, Northwestern and the University of Connecticut, one of the things that I focused on in the uh, research side of my uh, academic career was uh, how older adults um, step in uh, response to a perturbation or uh, under voluntary reaction time conditions. And this, of course, uh, was important for uh, understanding how inaccurate or, or steps of inappropriate amplitudes occur and result in falls. So I've been in, very interested in the problem of falls for a very long time and have been um, very fortunate to be uh, participating with the Academy of Geriatric Physical Therapy um, in building evidence-based documents on um, falls in community dwelling older persons. So today, um, when I was invited to the IPTA, um, I thought I would put together a, a, a presentation on um, evidence-based recommendations for um, the prevention and the management of falls in community dwelling older persons. So uh, what we'll be talking about and what I'll be sharing with you today mostly will be some of the work that we did in a recently published clinical guidance statement in the Physical Therapy Journal. It was a reference that I shared with you as well as uh, some of the CDC guidelines. So depending on your um, your background, depending on your interest level and the amount of time you've worked with older persons, you, uh, you may have a varying level of, uh, of uh, um, understanding and, and uh, familiarity with these um, uh, um, items. So uh, hopefully it'll be of some uh, use for you today. So this is our, uh, um, uh, a little bit of background that I'd like to provide. There's not a lot that we need to say about the problem of falls in terms of why it is important but uh, there are a few reasons, and you can see on the slides here that um, they uh, falls in community dwelling older persons uh, r result in quite a bit of uh, morbidity and mortality in our older adult population. So um, it uh, leads to hospitalization. Um, it leads to lots of, of, of things, as, as well as the cost to uh, the system. Um, one of the things that we also want to be aware of is that um, there are some differences between um, uh, men and women in the uh, uh, response to falls. Um, uh, older uh, women, um, you know, fall uh, and a fracture uh, quite a bit more than men, but men uh, tend to die uh, from falls more than women. There are also some uh, differences based on race and ethnicity, and uh, I don't have time to talk about those today, but uh, it's something that you should pursue in looking at the, the literature yourself because uh, there are differences. That, uh, it's not one size fits all when it comes to this sort of problem. So this is a little bit of background um, about uh, falls. And uh, the next thing uh, that I'd like to share is the problem of defining what a fall, in fact, is. Uh, you would think that we'd have a fairly consistent definition for something like this. Uh, however, we don't. And uh, there are numerous systematic reviews that uh, presently state that we don't have good definitions for what a fall consists of in our older adult uh, community dwelling population. So this is the most common one that you'll see. And it's an event which results in a person coming to rest inadvertently on the ground or other lower level regardless of whether an injury was sustained and not as a result of a major intrinsic event. And uh, this is somewhat of the controversial component of that definition, the issue of intrinsic event. Um, in primary care and from a, um, a medical perspective, uh, you'll see definitions where the intrinsic event, say uh, something like a, um, a fainting spell or, or other medical condition that resulted in a fall, is addressed in this category. So depending on if you're in rehab and you're a PT or you're a scientist or you're a physician, you may be using these sorts of different definitions. The ones that you see the most common in rehabilitation and in research is the one that I've listed here for you. So we would typically exclude an intrinsic event like However, 
um, if you look at CDC guidelines on this, um, they care about addressing this issue and whether or not somebody has orthostatic hypotension and, and or a cardiac condition that might be associated with the fall. So that's something that uh, we'll, pro we'll have to take into consideration in our screening and our assessment. Certainly when we're part of a multi-disciplinary um, uh, team. When we, um, it usually excludes something called an overwhelming hazard. That is a situation where uh, you or I might fall under that circumstance, uh, and we would expect that to be inevitable, that anybody would fall in that situation. And when I was at the University of Connecticut, I, one of the first studies I did as part of my fellowship was um, the investigation of strength training to the hip musculature as a, um, a treatment for um, improving standing balance and falls. Turned out that if you strengthen the hip, uh, the hip gets stronger, but it doesn't really have a whole impact on falls. Anyway, story for another time. But um, one of the things that we had to do was ask about uh, our, our subject's fall status. And um, we had a lady come in, and uh, she had reported a fall. And so I said, what, um, what were the circumstances uh, uh, when you fell? And she said, well, I was carrying my canoe down the sand bank of the river, and the sand went out from under me, and I fell down. And so we considered that an overwhelming hazard that probably most people would have been challenged in that situation. So um, the circumstances matter. And when we get to screening, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit. So briefly, let's go over a few of the risk factors that are important in understanding what potentially leads to falls in community dwelling older persons. We base those uh, risk factors in sort of intrinsic elements as well as extrinsic elements. So what you see here are the most common and most important intrinsic factors for um, uh, prediction of falls. Weakness, particularly of the lower extremities, is, is basically the number one uh, most commonly cited uh, risk factor. Uh, Aging is up there with that as well, too, especially as you get above 80, 85 years of age. Um, but fall history is the second most important one. So those are the big two. And then not surprisingly, you see some of these other ones. Um, gait and balance deficits, uh, that's a great challenge for us as physical therapists and physical therapy professionals because we don't know a whole lot about how to test for gait and balance impairments. We think we do, but it turns out we don't have a whole lot of data on that. And we'll talk about that extensively tonight. Uh, visual deficits, it's not just acuity, it's contrast sensitivity, it's depth perception, and in many cases, it's the correction of, of of um, acuity that uh, it leads to fall, so we'll talk about that. Chronic conditions should be no surprise. The, as we increase comorbidities, we increase uh, the potential for frailty, and that can lead to um, uh, uh, the incidence of fall rates going up. Behavioral factors are important to consider. Depression and fear are independent risk factors for falls. We have some tools to assess fear or um, efficacy or lack of confidence, um, and there are some for depression as well. We're really going to focus tonight more on the gait and balance and strengthening kinds of issues and less on some of these others uh, just because of the time. So uh, there's that. Cognitive impairment is increasingly look being uh, considered and looked at now that we have uh, uh, much more uh, science on mild cognitive impairment and the continuum for, from that through all the way to neurologic degenerative diagnoses like Alzheimer's disease. So we know that cognitive impairment plays a role um, and is a, now a risk factor for falls. And then uh, multiple medications, polypharmacy, four or more medications. And uh, we'll have some slides on that a little bit later. But the psychoactive drugs, especially the benzodiazepines, these are the worst ones. And uh, if you've ever taken a benzodiazepine and within a couple hours and you try to get up from sitting down, you'll notice that it's not that easy to do all the time, especially in our older adult population. So that's those are issues. Um, a lot of the sedating over-the-counter medications are also a problem. Uh, Tylenol PM, which has um, Benadryl in it. Benadryl is the sort of sleep component to, uh, to those kinds of medications. And uh, these First generation antihistamines are sedating. Um, they're CNS uh, uh, sedatives, so those are problems as well, too. Um, extrinsic risk factors. You're not going to be surprised by the usual suspects when you look at these. But the first one is the improper use of assistive devices. So um, it might come as no surprise that um, 
the little old lady carrying her narrow-based quad cane um, <laughs> or uh, you know, trying to uh, carry the walker around is, is probably at a, a, an environmental hazard. Stairs, um, their design as well as the ability to use um, uh, upper extremity support are issues. Obviously, surfaces, obstacles, pets, uh, anything that can produce a tripping hazard are also some things that uh, are considered extrinsic risk factors. One of the things that um, are also on the list that we want to consider is uh, poor lighting. And we often in physical therapy work on balance training with eyes open and eyes closed, but we should very much seriously consider working in low light situations. We would never practice gait with our eyes closed in this population, but we should be practicing gait with, uh, in low lit situations uh, because it's really common and those are the times when they're at most at risk. Um, so with uh, the risk factors uh, listed, I wanted to show you this uh, uh, figure. This is from the CDC. And if you type in CDC study, S-T-E-A-D-I in Google or something, you'll find this web page. It's pretty easily accessible. Study stands for Stopping Elderly um, Accidents, uh, uh, Death, and Injuries, I think. So it's really focused on trying to prevent injuries in older adults, particularly community-dwelling older adults. And there's a ton of, of literature on this uh, web page for practitioners as well as for patients. Um, it's primarily geared toward the uh, primary care physician. That's who it was written for. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it's based off of the American Geriatric Society and British Geriatric Society clinical practice guideline that was uh, published and revised in 2010. Anyway, one of the documents on this website is what we call the Stay Independent Brochure. And the reason that I put it in right here is because it specifically asks about risk factors. That is its primary intention, to identify the number of risk factors in a person presenting to you in a clinic uh, setting or in the, the physician's office. So as you can see from the list here, you basically get a yes or no and points associated with these risk factors. And given what we just uh, listed for you before, you see um, that the, the first two that are scored a little bit higher, I have fallen in the past year. So we know fall history is a risk factor and it's quite a big one. So it gets two points if you, if you say yes to that. Um, I use or have been advised to use a cane or walker to get around safely. That speaks to your balance or your potential gait impairment. And so that's another one that gets a big score, two points if you have a yes to that. Sometimes I feel unsteady when walking, still gait and balance issues. I steady myself by holding on to furniture, walking at home. So I'm more balance. I'm worried about falling. So fear or lack of efficacy uh, gets a point if they uh, have a worry. I need to push up with my hands to stand up from a chair. Speaks to the lower extremity weakness. You can see all of these are, are the risk factors that we've been talking about. I have trouble stepping onto a curb. I have to rush to uh, use the toilet. Incontinence is a risk factor um, for falls in community dwelling older persons. That's why we have that one on there. I have lost some feeling in my feet, comorbidities such as uh, diabetes with their associated neuropathies. I take medicine that sometimes makes me feel lightheaded. Uh, again, any of the sedating or psychotropic medications that are risk factors for falls. Um, also for antidepressants or sleep, oftentimes um, we get benzodiazepines prescribed for just sleep issues and that can be problematic. Um, as well as I often feel sad or depressed, depression as a risk factor. So to sum up, this is a nice tool, very simple, again, built for the physician but can be used in the, <clears throat> in the physical therapy clinic to identify very quickly potential risk factors. So that's what the STAY independent brochure um, does for us and you can see that it highlights the kinds of things that we just talked about. So having given you a bit of background on um, risk factors, I'd like to take you through now um, a little story about evidence. This is uh, done at the beginning because if I did it about 30 minutes from now, everybody would be asleep. But um, the reason that I want to talk about evidence is because we've now reached a point in the literature and with the ability to store data and information that really just looking at a single RCT to make a decision, to make a clinical decision, isn't really the way to go anymore. 
Uh, it was 20, 30 years ago when we only had a few RCTs and things. And of course, it does depend on the topic. If we have a, a novel topic that there's very little literature on, then we have to obviously use uh, small amounts of data. But that's not the case anymore with falls and community dwelling older persons. We have to use data that's been bundled, synthesized, cr critically appraised, as well as uh, then um, uh, uh, integrated with patient values in order to make decisions. And so that's where we're at as a profession. That's where we're at as folks who worry about falls in our, in our, um, in our patients. So let me take you through a little bit of what's been happening in terms of evidence in the literature and uh, some reminders of the levels of evidence, because I think that has some value to understanding what we did with our clinical guidance statement. So where do we search? For those of us who are APTA members, if you look down uh, at the bottom of the uh, um, uh, presentation, you'll see PT Now. And uh, for those who aren't familiar with PT Now, it is a, a database, it is a storage of information site within the APTA website that allows us to um, uh, ask questions, then get some answers at multiple levels of analysis. So you can find clinical summaries, which are basically expert literature reviews there. You can find um, links to clinical practice guidelines, the English guideline um, usually referred to as NICE, N-I-C-E, is available through that website, um, as well as other levels of information. So the PT now is very, very good for this. And in neurologic physical therapy, in geriatric physical therapy, in orthopedic physical therapy, there's lots of information there for us, especially for falls. So that's a place to look. Obviously, you have the, the typical search engines like PubMed. Um, I like to tell folks that um, if you go to clinical queries in PubMed, you'll find uh, a much quicker search for systematic reviews and relevant clinical papers on that. Um, and so I, I always like to tell people, besides just the, the main page at PubMed, to check out clinical queries because you'll find those SRs pretty quickly. And we'll talk about what SRs are in just a minute. But the other two, if you're so inclined to go a little bit further, a little bit deeper, um, you can check out Pedro and you can check out the TRIP database. And these two databases um, are really nice databases. Pedro gets you to systematic reviews, RCTs, randomized control trials, and clinical practice guidelines. So where you probably wouldn't see as much clinical practice guideline data in PubMed, you're going to get that there because people in rehab uh, built this database, and that's a good one to check out. Um, uh, the TRIP database is nice because you can use um, uh, something called the PICO or PICO method in generating a question that you can get answers to. And then in that TRIP database, you, they, they weight the papers in terms of quality and accessibility and content so that you get the best available evidence at the top of that list. So PICO basically means you put in the patient population, the intervention you're interested in, any comparison if you wanted to compare balance training with uh, iontophoresis or something like that, it doesn't matter. But uh, comparing things and then what kind of outcome are you interested in? Are you interested in falls? Are you interested in better balance? Are you interested in gait? And, and that will allow you to do that. So depending on how much time you have and how interested you are to look at some of the more clinically focused databases, those are two to really check out because they're pretty nice. Um, Basically, our job as, as professionals within um, sections and academies in the APTA is to try to get this information filtered into and accessible through PT now. So that's worth a look. Um, so for those of us who've, who've been through this, and, and, and it's been a while for some others, you'll remember and you look over on the left-hand side of the screen as you're facing it, the, um, the traditional sort of levels of evidence pyramid that we're used to. And at the lowest level of evidence, we're all re we all recall that that's basically expert opinion. Um, we look to our colleagues when we don't get the answers from the literature. Uh, and so that's sort of the lowest level of evidence. And then as we move up, we have case series and case reports. We have retrospective studies, that is looking at people who have the problem as well as who don't have the problem and see what they did over a period of time in the past. Those are retrospective or case control type studies. We have people who've fallen. We have people who have not fallen. What's different about them? Those are the kinds of retrospective studies and we're moving up to higher levels of evidence there. 
Then we have cohort studies where we're actually now looking at folks and following them. Here are those people who fall. Let's see what they do. Let's see how they progress. What's happening as things go along? Observational-like studies that get a little bit higher evidence. And then we have randomized control trials, which most people have, uh, are, are familiar with. Those are those special uh, treatment-based research studies where we randomly put folks into different groups and we blind the assessors, hopefully, the people who are treating as well as the people who are assessing them, and then see if these treatments are doing anything. And uh, this typically, uh, uh, historically, was the highest level of evidence. But since then, we've now added systematic reviews. And we'll, we'll define that for you in just a minute. But I want to direct your attention to the other half of this slide because nowadays we have a different way of viewing levels of evidence. And it's important for us as physical therapists therapist, physical therapy professionals to understand this because um, as I said, it's probably not good enough in this literature at least to just base decisions on a single RCT, a single randomized controlled trial. Because if you look over in the, on the other side of the screen, you'll notice that um, randomized controlled trials now are somewhat in the middle of this level of evidence pyramid. And, and you'll see though, it's in the middle, but it's also at something called uh, the top of what we call the unfiltered information. And that's an important point. So when an RCT comes out, we expect that it's probably worth something because it's been, it's been published in a peer-reviewed paper. Um, there's probably been, um, well, there's been IRB, uh, uh, Institutional Review Board approval and ethics approval, and we've probably done a good job at doing these sorts of things. But there are lots of places for bias and for error within these kinds of studies. So what we eventually and now need to do is we need to take unfiltered um, information, unfiltered research information, and start to do something called filtering it or appraising it, um, assessing its quality, and then taking these individual bits of information and bringing them together to synthesize them. And that's what a systematic review does for us. It basically allows an appraisal or an assessment of the quality of the individual papers and then a synthesis of all of the papers together to make a, um, uh, uh, to give an answer to a particular question. The question may be, does um, treadmill training with body weight support improve balance and gait function in people who fall? all in the community. And so then you can com combine all of the papers that, that look at this type of problem, evaluate whether or not they did a good job making those papers, and then say, yes, in fact, this treatment does work, or no, this treatment does not work. And that's where a systematic review basically ends. It's, it answers that question. It does work. It doesn't work. And so what I'd like to do then, just to summarize, is that RCTs are the highest level of information for unfiltered information, but then we have a whole new level of analysis for, ev uh, for evidence where we filter it, we evaluate it, and then we use that synthesized and critiqued information to make clinical decisions and write those clinical decisions in forms of recommendations and clinical practice guidelines, or in the case that are of our paper, in clinical guidance statements. So that's why I show you that. So looking at it a little bit in summary, we're now just going to reverse the process a little bit. Individual studies are what we basically have as the raw information. That's where knowledge is sort of being acquired. Systematic reviews allow us the synthesis of those bits of information and an appraisal in the, of the quality of that information to make a decision about thumbs up or thumbs down on a particular treatment. And then by using those systematic reviews, which again has synthesized all that unfiltered information, we now have a product to produce, to provide to professionals and to, uh, uh, to colleagues in the form of, of recommendations. And these are clinical practice guidelines. This will be fun. This uh, just said low battery, 10%. <laughs> So let's see what uh, where we'll, we'll go with that. So some definitions. Um, clinical practice guidelines are graded recommendations on best practice for a specific problem, a specific condition or question. And it's based on the systematic review of papers. So we have to do systematic reviews in order to produce these evidence-based recommendations. And the recommendations come in the form of you should do this, you shouldn't do that, you must do this, you mustn't do that. And if you don't do this, you better have a good reason why. Okay, um, They're defined by stringent methodology, so there is a whole institution of, uh, and, and journals and, and associations just on the business of putting together clinical practice guidelines. 
Uh, the APTA has an evidence-based document initiative, which is now funding multiple sections in building clinical practice guidelines. Probably not too many peds therapists in here today, but the pediatric section is a, a forefront, uh, a, a leader in developing these things. Sandra Kaplan and her crew have built a, a clinical muscular, uh, a cervical muscular torticollis guideline, and orthopedic section has a bunch and now um, uh, geriatrics and other sections are building them as well too. Um, the important part of, of clinical practice guidelines is it offers a chance to integrate values, um, cost benefit, as well as the evidence together to make these kinds of recommendations. The whole purpose, of course, is to, just to improve quality of care and to decrease unwarranted variation. These aren't things that we're forcing uh, uh, physical therapy professionals to use, but they're used to help assist in decision making and go, yeah, my patient fits this and I think this would be a good thing to do. So again, the major difference between systematic reviews and clinical practice guidelines is that the SRs are identifying and combining studies using a, an explicit methodology, and um, the, the CPGs, the clinical practice guidelines, are using that information to make the decision. So typically, systematic reviews don't go to the point of making the recommendation. They simply answer yes or no, the treatment works. Um, this is going to be hard to see for folks, but um, in the clinical guidance statement that uh, you have as a reference, we have um, uh, synthesized the levels of evidence across multiple clinical practice guidelines. So a clinical guidance statement, that, that document that uh, was a reference here tonight um, uh, from PT Journal, is a, actually a synthesis of multiple guidelines. So before we in the Academy of Geriatric Physical Therapy um, decide to actually build a clinical practice guideline for people um, who fall or are at risk for falling in the community. We wanted to say, well, what guidelines exist out there already and what can we as physical therapists take away from these guidelines? So we're synthesizing guidelines in a guidance statement here. So we have different levels of evidence. Now these are going to follow suit along with that pyramid that you're used to. Level one evidence is evidence from systematic reviews, meta-analyses of, re of uh, randomized controlled trials. Uh, so that's the highest level of evidence. Um, the level two level of evidence is evidence from at least one controlled trial without randomization. So when we don't randomize, we have a little bit lower quality level of evidence, or at least one other type of quasi-experimental study. That might have been a cohort study. It might have been um, uh, uh, some other type of prospective observational study. And then as we move down, we get to the case control types of studies at level three and the, um, the, uh, the expert opinion or case reports at level four. So just like the pyramid, we use those levels of evidence now to do what? To uh, make grades of recommendations. Just like you would think when you think of the term grade, we make A level grades and B level grades and C level grades. And these are matched up with the levels of evidence and the quality of that evidence as well as how much evidence there is for that. So an A grade is a strong Grade is a recommendation based on level one or level two evidence, but um, not as strong as level one and so forth. So A, B, C, um, and things like that. So when you look at clinical practice guidelines, look at the, the, it'll be always in the front of those guidelines and it'll say, okay, here are the grades of evidence and you'll get to see that. The orthopedic section does a real nice job of that. In their guidelines, you see exactly what those grades mean and they tweak some of the lower grades. They have um, foundational level kinds of grades, which are basically, we don't have a lot of RCTs. We don't have a lot of randomized controlled trials, but you know what? There's a lot of physiological foundational mechanical evidence that suggests this is a good thing. So at the level of basic science, it makes sense to do this, that there's a basis for it. So at least we have something. It's a nice feature of what they're doing in, in their work. So um, I wanted to show you that to show you the link between levels of evidence and the grades of recommendation. All right. Done with that. How are we doing? Good. Perfect timing. Um, let's talk about screening assessment and treatment in the prevention of falls in community dwelling older persons. The process looks like this, whether it be um, a, a, a patient comes to you in, in, for, in whatever setting,
But it's basically standard practice now today that all older adults should be here. It really falls on the team to make sure that this is happening. Uh, it might mean that it's the, the primary care physician because that older adult might not be receiving other services, which is perfectly fine. Uh, but it might be you as the physical therapy professional. Now, when you look at AGPT, that's the Academy of Geriatric PT. That's the paper that we wrote uh, to PTJ that was just published. So when you see that, that's coming from that, that guidance statement, that synthesis of clinical practice guidelines. So uh, our recommendation for screening is that physical therapists should routinely ask older adult patients if they have fallen at least uh, every 12 months. Um, you'll notice that the level of evidence and the strength of that recommendation is lower because, in fact, we know that while we can do good screening, it doesn't actually lead to reduction of falls because you've got to do a lot more than just screening to identify risk factors, right? So we get a little bit lower of evidence. The screening should include the following. History and context of falls over the last 12 months. We have to understand the circumstances, as well as one question about their perception or difficulty of walking and balancing. So we'll get to that in just a second. But what I want to do as a, as a lead-in to those details is show you uh, two algorithms, one from the CDC and one from our paper in PTJ, on um, how to go through this process of screening and where does that screening lead to. So the first thing that I'm going to do is take you through the CDC study uh, uh, web page um, algorithm that's on their site. So. Um, here we have a, 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 an older adult, community dwelling older adult, coming into a facility, whether it be the physician's office, an outpatient PT clinic. Um, they're screened for falls. Doesn't matter if they're coming in for non-traumatic shoulder pain. Um, if they're over the ages of six, over the age of 65, they should be screened. Um, and we ask these questions: Have you fallen in the past year? That is obviously the most important question that we ask. The single most important question. Secondly, how many times if you have fallen and were you injured, that's if they have a yes. Um, we also ask, according to the CDC guidelines, do you feel unsteady when standing or walking or interested in their balance and their gait? And are you worried about falling? If they answer no to all of these, you'll see that that leads them over to the uh, right-hand side of the screen and puts them at low risk. So the fact that they're 65 or older um, at, really puts them at low risk to begin with. So there is no, technically no risk in this population. They're all at at least a low risk. And what a low risk means is that assuming that we get no to those answers, then we can provide some education, some uh, uh, material, which the CDC does offer, on falls in community dwelling older persons. And most importantly, um, if we're doing, I think if we're doing our job right, we have information about community programs that would be appropriate for somebody like that. So that might, uh, might be uh, programs at the senior centers or YMCAs, uh, other health facilities that are hopefully low cost or free um, and will improve or to support their exercise or their, uh, their balance and their gait. These could be things like Tai Chi or other types of programs like Stepping On or others. But what happens if they answer yes to any of these questions? If they answer yes to any of these questions, then they need to be evaluated for gait, strength, and balance. Now, this is the biggest issue presently with this CDC algorithm is, what are your choices for doing these screens? And the most important choice that they've made at this point is probably the one that will change the soonest because um, it is the timed up and go. And for those of you who know the timed up and go, you get up from a chair, you walk about three meters, you turn around, come back and sit down at a natural, comfortable pace. Well, that's their recommended screen. That screen is primarily a screen of functional mobility. They use it as essentially a gait and a fall prediction screen. What we know is, is that the timed up and go is in fact not a very good predictor of future falls. Um, the, Amer the Academy of Geriatric PT will have a systematic review come out in the next six to eight months that will demonstrate that through exhaustive literature uh, review on, on hundreds of papers on the timed up and go. And if you read any of the new ones within the last couple of years, you'll also see that basically the tug is not the greatest for predicting falls. So for a lot of those of us who've been in the world of, of geriatric PT for a while, that we had a number in our head about 13 and a half seconds that you used to determine if somebody was at risk or, at no, or not at risk. If they were over that, 
they were at risk, we got to do something. Um, the CDC uses 12 seconds. Basically, they use a very conservative estimate to try to get over the fact that it's not very predictive. So um, they're going to throw folks who probably or may not be at risk into that because they've lowered the score, but they're trying to be safe and trying to, to make that kind of decision. So essentially, you have the timed up and go, and then you have the 30 second chair stand. And the 30 second chair stand, obviously, is how many times you can stand up from a chair in 30 seconds. Um, the CDC gives you, by age range, the scores that you should use. Remember, the 30 second chair stand is essentially a proxy for functional lower extremity strength. It is a great measure to determine to generate uh, some sense of their lower extremity strength. That's about what it's good for. Uh, we don't have any real good data on, on uh, falls and predictor of falls, though, but they give you some numbers to use there. And then you have the four-stage balance test. Uh, the four-stage balance test is essentially four tests, static tests that you do with your eyes open. The first one is feet together or a typical Romberg position. Feet together, eyes open. The second position is one where you're in a semi-tandem stance where the, uh, uh, the metatarsal of one foot is hitting the instep of the other foot. So again, partial tandem stance. Third test is a full tandem, heel to toe position. And then the fourth one is a single leg stance. And you're asked to just to try to hold that for a period of time. Um, well, what do we know about this and its ability to predict falls? Essentially, we know not a whole lot about um, any of them except the, uh, the tandem stance. Tandem stance is actually pretty darn good. Uh, they actually have the only data that they use for the, for the four-stage balance test is if they can't do the tandem for 10 seconds, then they're at risk for falls. Because partly we know that anybody basically over the age of 80 isn't going to stand for, one, uh, for 10 seconds on one leg. This is just natural uh, uh, obligatory aging. So um, there's, there are those kinds of things. However, of course, if you have somebody standing with feet together with their eyes open and they don't make it 10 seconds, you should probably be worried, right? So uh, there's that too. Um, but really, it's the tandem one, assuming that they get through the first two. So that's a bit of information there. Now, if they went through that and the scores were, uh, were um, uh, basically leading you to believe, and I, wouldn't worry, I would worry more about what your clinical impression is rather than those scores, because again, the tug is, again, we don't, we don't have a great number to, to predict that. But if you felt that they did pretty good on those, that would be no. So even though they may have fallen, um, or they may have um, uh, felt unsteady, but they don't have a, um, a problem with their balance or gait, uh, then we would have an answer no to gait or balance problems. That would still put them at low risk, and therefore they should be referred to community programming. So what happens if, um, well, that's, I just talked through that, timed up and go for mobility, 30-second chair stand for leg strength, for stage balance test is a static balance. There is also a screen for postural hypotension. We won't talk about that today. Um, but what happens if we have a yes to uh, those tests? They do the, 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 the lower extremity strength chair stand. They do um, the timed up and go and they get a 20 seconds or something and they get the four stage balance test and they can't do uh, that as well too and you get a yes. Now you have to sort of extrapolate. Did they have a gait balance problem and no falls? Did they have a gait balance problem with one fall or a gait balance problem with greater than two falls? Let's take no falls. Let's say they were worried about their balance or they feel like uh, they're off balance. You gave them the screen, you got a yes. That puts them at moderate risk. So no falls with a gait and balance problem sets somebody up at a moderate risk. And a moderate risk is one of those places where you need to do a number of things. We're going to have to go through medication review, uh, probably manage um, their, uh, their gait and their balance issues. Whether or not that's done in outpatient therapy or in the clinic itself or whether it's done in a community program depends on the programming that you have and, and what you know you can do for those folks. Um, so that's one of those places where either could work. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later to, uh, tonight. In the event of, of one fall with no injury, that also puts them at moderate risk. And if they have one fall with injury or greater than or equal to two falls, then they're considered high risk and we then move to a formal multifactorial assessment. And at this point, we need basically a full team of workup to in, or, in order to do all of these things. I'll talk about this a little bit more as we go on, but that, that multifactorial assessment for people who are at high risk, injuries, 
um, or greater than two falls with balance problems is going to hopefully lead to um, uh, uh, an approach that deals with specific risk factors and then leads to formal intervention. So let's compare that to what we had in our, uh, our, our guidance statement from PT Journal. And this is specifically written for the patient who walks into the PT clinic with or without a balance problem. So they come, the older adult comes to the PT clinic, um, either you observe a balance or, or, or mobility impairment, or you don't observe a balance or mobility impairment, and you ask them whether or not they've fallen in the previous year, consistent with CDC guidelines. Um, or if they have difficulty with balance or gait. So if you observe a balance or gait problem as they're waiting to come back to see you for their shoulder, you're probably going to need to do a, a balance screen. That's uh, a, a recommendation from the academy. Um, on the other hand, if you don't observe a gait or balance problem, but they've fallen or they uh, have reported difficulty with falling, you're also going to do that screen. If none of that happens, then go ahead and treat the shoulder and move on, right? Um, but if you identify um, this and then do that screen, um, if nothing happens here, then it's a negative screen. You can continue with usual care. Um, we're down to 5%. <laughs> I got it back up. Okay, beautiful. Um, so if you have um, done the screen and they have a balance or mobility impairment noted, then we start doing our more formal assessment and that moves into the treatment. The formal assessment in our world will be a medication review. Obviously, we can't make changes to that, but we should understand what they're taking. Um, to do a formal medical history to understand their comorbidities, and to do a formal assessment that's going to include things like strength and balance and mobility and footwear and, and environmental hazards and things like that. Um, if some of these items identify problems that are outside the scope of our practice, it's our obligation to, to do a referral. Um, if they're within our scope of practice, then we can build an intervention for that. So even if somebody comes to you without a problem, but you identify one, it, it now forces us to act and to address that problem. Here are some questions that um, we want uh, folks to ask if they've had, um, if, ask their patients if they've uh, fallen. Things like, where have they fallen? What were they doing? Um, did they feel dizzy or lose consciousness? We want to try to uh, triangulate that with potentially cardiac or neurologic symptoms. Were they confused before or after the fall? Again, towards the neurological um, situation. Why they thought they fall? Are they worried? And what activities uh, make them feel that they are going to fall? That helps us, gives us some information on uh, uh, problems that might lead to potential treatments. Well, it always happens in the dark. It always happens outside. Or, um, you know, uh, the pet uh, fell or crossed my path and I, and I fell. So, and that happens. It happens a lot, actually. Um, so for each patient who reports a fall or falls or reports difficulty with balance or walking, PTs should screen by observing gait and balance impairment. Now, here's the problem with that. The clinical practice guidelines that presently exist, the AGS-BGS, that's the, the Geriatric Society, the English ones, they actually don't give a specific recommendation for the types of tests to use. So when we looked at the CDC, we had screens for time with time up and go, with uh, the 30-second chair stand, and the, um, uh, the four-stage balance test. Here, though, we're going to have to do um, a, a bit more because we really want to do a, a, a good screen that really gets at balance and, and gait uh, difficulty. Now, here's an important point. That's why I put the big uh, exclamation point up there. Um, a screening is positive when um, a number of things happen. If the patient reports multiple falls regardless of balance um, testing. So, just like in the CDC, if they've got multiple falls within the last year, there's a problem. We don't have to triangulate it with the, with the balance data. We're going to have to figure out what's happening and to do that. On the other hand, if the patient reports one fall and they have a balance or gait impairment, that's also an indication of a positive screen. So if they had one fall and didn't, you didn't observe a gait or balance impairment, we wouldn't necessarily call that um, a positive screen. That's an important delineation. Um, and as I said, 
the, um, the, the clinical practice guidelines that we refer to and synthesize data from, they only mentioned these uh, tools. They didn't recommend them. So if you read somewhere the guidelines have recommended these, that's actually not true. Uh, the timed up and go was mentioned. We've talked about that. The Berg Balance Scale, for years, it had a number associated with its uh, risk factors. I think it was about the mid-40 range. Um, we know that that's not the greatest number to use anymore. Um, and the performance-oriented mobility assessment, or Tanetti scale, also had some scores. That one actually turns out to be a little bit better than the other ones, um, but I find that to be a bit cumbersome to use. And so uh, uh, generally fall back on doing a number of tests, doing kind up and go for mobility, doing the Berg, or its, uh, or its counterpart for higher level folks called the Fullerton. Um, that one basically combines Berg-like tests with the dynamic gait index, who came out of Cal State Fullerton, and somebody named Deborah Rose, who does a lot in falls in, in California. Um, so again, no cutoff scores. Uh, that we can really firmly recommend. We'll have some more data on that in the next probably couple of years, though. So having gone through a bit of the assessment, um, let's assume for the sake of our argument here today that we have folks who now need a formal assessment. We've done the screening. We've identified they either have multiple falls or they've had one fall with a balance or gait impairment. Using your best um, decision making by looking at some of those tools, what should we do? Well, in those instances, they need a multi-component or multi-factorial assessment. And that really means that we have to do more than what we're probably capable of within our scope of practice. We've got to bring in physician, other services as well. But what should we do as PTs and what can we really focus on? And that's what we'll talk about now. So PT should provide an individualized assessment within the scope of our practice that contributes to that multifactorial assessment in fall risk. And we should be looking at additional uh, risk factors and, and uh, sending them to the appropriate providers. So this is a little bit stronger recommendation um, for uh, folks who interact with these individuals. So let me take you through some of the big picture items in the uh, assessment. So lower extremity strength, 30 second chair stands, a pretty good proxy for that, otherwise manual muscle testing. Again, balance is important, but we don't have a lot of specific procedures that have been recommended in current clinical practice guidelines. Gait, gait needs to be evaluated, but primarily the, uh, the indicators that lead us to stability issues, and we'll talk about what those specifically are. Also though, the use of, of assistive devices uh, should be evaluated as well too. So when we talk about gait and balance, these are the big ones that I think we should probably be spending time with. For gait, comfortable gait speed, as well as dynamic gait index. Mobility, the timed up and go. Um, balance, the Berg scale, the best test, which is getting a little bit more uh, literature uh, uh, on that. The Fullerton, which is basically a combination of the dynamic gait index and the Berg balance scale for higher level folks. And something called the four square step test, which uh, is, is emerging as a uh, potentially important tool. We still put in the, the Tinetti scale in there, but uh, I don't see that being used quite as much anymore, um, and certainly not have any recommendations on it. Um, I wanted to highlight this because a lot of people um, should be assessing gait speed of our community dwelling older persons. And um, uh, Fritz and Lusardi wrote a paper in the journal of Geriatric PT back in 09 that puts a beautiful figure and summary of the literature on there. But I wanted to highlight for you some of the uh, things that we can discern from gait speed. And basically, um, for a lot of those folks, if they're under one meter per second, they're probably at risk for falls. Um, but that has to be tempered with uh, their age. So we know that uh, from a paper from Michelle Lusardi and, and others from JGPT a few years ago, that if you're in the 60 to 80 range, you're probably, if, if you don't have a bunch of comorbidities, you should be in that 1 to 1.25 range. And so you should be above that, that sort of cutoff for worrying about uh, falls just purely on that measure. However, if you'll notice, once we get to 80 to 90 and 90 up to about 101, which they have data on, we're in 0.82 and 0.71 as means for those gate speeds, meters per second gate speed. So we wouldn't expect somebody in this age range to be up at that one. That's a normal 
decline in gait speed. Um, but we also know because now they're at, up in 85 range, their increase uh, risk goes up uh, uh, twofold. So um, we want to be aware of what kinds of, of scores people have normally on gait speed, and then to be able to then look at and go, okay, well, if I'm in the 0.8 or the 0.6 range, I know that I'm probably limited in my community mobility. I'm probably having problems um, with, with gait. And if I get below that, even in the 0.4 range, I'm probably having disability. So um, gait speed's an important one. We can make some sense of that. Um, the dynamic gait index. So as I said, the timed up and go is going to turn out to be not a great predictive measure of falls. But the dynamic gait index is a little bit better. And, and this is going to come out in some systematic reviews in probably in the next year as well, too, from Academy. And um, so there's two types of dynamic gait index. There's one that's a four item and one that's an eight item. The eight item is basically all of these. The four item are the ones that are starred. And we do have some general scores for those. Um, for the eight item, it's been 19 out of 24. And that's uh, still held up to be pretty, pretty well. Um, for CDOA, that's community dwelling older persons. If you do the four item, which I, I, uh, I think has been used a lot more for people with vestibular problems, um, that's at a 10 out of 12 score. The four square step test um, is a, a, a nice uh, a, a step test that looks at the ability of the person to start in one grid. Basically, you put four canes down on the floor, and they start in this one uh, coordinate right here. They step forward. They step sideways, they step back, they step sideways the other direction, then they step sideways back here, step forward, step sideways, and step back, and you, get and you time that. And we're getting more literature on that. The original paper is here um, from Archives of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. We don't have specific data on the best scores and the scores that predict falls. We're getting that. Um, but I wanted to just mention and show that to you because that's something to look for in the future. And the value to this is that it's looked specifically at stepping. And that's a big issue in our folks um, who have problems with falls. So some of the things we're not talking about today that are in the AG, uh, uh, AGPT guide, guidance statement things on health conditions like uh, osteoporosis and depression, some other body structures and functions, incontinence, vision, uh, uh, foot problems, uh, activities like ADLs, and then some contextual factors, alcohol use and things like that. I do want to state, though, that for fear of falling, we have two basic tools. We have the activity-specific balance competence um, uh, uh, tool, which is for higher level community dwelling folks, and then we have the falls efficacy scale or the modified falls efficacy scale, and that's used primarily for people of a little bit lower functioning but still living in the community. So we have some tools for that as well, too. Okay, let's talk about interventions. What do we know about interventions for persons who fall? So just as this assessment is multifactorial, so too must be the interventions. We have to have targeted interventions that specifically address risk factors for the individual that you're facing. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you see all the kinds of things that we'll probably be referring out to our, uh, our colleagues and the other health professions. Modification of medications, treatment of postural hypotension, treatment of vision impairment, um, managing foot and footwear, we can do some of that. Um, podiatrists do a good job at that too. Vitamin D supplementation, um, uh, cardiovascular disorders and alcohol use. On the right hand side, this is the stuff that we can do a lot with and we should. So there's gait training. What extent of gait training should we be using? We'll talk about that. Advice on and use on assistive devices, and really focusing on exercise balance and strength training. Um, the key take home message for us with our folks in the community is that any exercise program for falls in these individuals must incorporate both strengthening and balance. Strengthening alone just doesn't cut it. So we need something that incorporates both. Obviously, modification of environmental hazards, and then dealing with the uh, uh, understanding of wellness programs and things like that. One quick comment on the uh, minimization of medications. Uh, obviously, folks can't always go off of medications, but what I listed for you here were the, the most common benzodiazepines that if you look at somebody's uh, history, medical history, that's the end of that. <laughs> I technically have a little bit more time, so. Yeah, it's right for a little bit.
for you. These are the these are the these are the bad boys. Um, so make sure you look for those. And we want to find out if those can be modified. Those are the big the big worrisome ones. Okay? The Xanax, the Clonopins, the Valiums, the Restoral, Halcyon. Okay, next slide. Vitamin D, this is an interesting story. Um, uh, for years, it was, don't use vitamin D, we didn't need it. And then for about five to six years, it was, give everybody vitamin D, and it has an effect on falls, let's do it. Now, more recently, in the 2012 Cochrane Review, they said, you know, it turns out that it's more of a mixed result. So basically what they're doing is for anybody who has a proven deficiency, we know that if they have a deficiency, they benefit from supplementation. And it should be around 800 units per day. That's the recommendation. Um, uh, some people are taking up to 50,000 units once time a week. So um, you can do that and pretty safely uh, for most folks. So if there's a deficiency, we know that it affects muscle function. We know that it affects falls. If you're not deficient, it's probably not a big deal. Um, so that's what we're saying about that. That's obviously something the doc or the pharmacist has to manage with the doc. Okay, next slide. Um, vision. Vision's a, a, this is an interesting one. So from a medical perspective, we know that the cataract surgery, if they have cataracts, has an, in, an effect on falls. They need to get that surgery if they want to reduce their falls, um, if they have cataracts. Now, here's the thing about uh, a visual acuity correction. As a standalone treatment, it's not enough. And in fact, if they have both near and far sightedness, we know that multifocal lenses are dangerous. Um, using and prescribing multifocal lenses for people um, is advised against because when they use them, they tend to fall more. When they get rid of them, there are studies that show you stop using the multifocal lenses, you fall less. So that's an issue. So the acuity issue is, is one that has to be managed. If you see multifocal lenses or bifocal lenses on your folks and they have problems with falls, you better get them back to the doc and say, you know, it's worth talking about. And that's a value thing that they're going to have to deal with, and they're going to ultimately make that decision, but you should be aware of the evidence. Next slide, please. So our recommendation is this. Physical therapists must provide individualized interventions that address all positive risk factors within our scope. So we've got a lot to do. Next um, thing. And the must means you, you better have a good reason for not doing these things. Um, strength training. Strength training should be individually prescribed. We'll talk about um, some guidelines on that. Balance training, that's individually prescribed. Gait training, um, uh, we will talk about exactly what kind of gait training to do and not do. Correction of environmental hazards, we won't touch on today. And footwear, we won't touch on, but those are all parts of the things that we do. So this is an important slide. Go ahead and go up a little bit so we see the lower and a bit of the higher grid right there. So if we were to make a very broad statement by looking at those algorithms that we showed you earlier, the people at low risk, who haven't had multiple falls are likely best served by good community programming. And that good community programming, the mo two most popular ones across in, in the basically in the world are the Stepping On program and the Tai Chi program. And I'll call, I'll touch on those at the end, time uh, time permitting. But notice that if we go to that higher or moderate risk, then we have to look at interventions that are more specific and obviously where we're going to play a, a larger role. Um, for the higher risk, those those folks who are relatively frail, there's one popular program that can be uh, uh, inst instituted in the home, and it's called the Otago Exercise Program. And if you if you type in Otago Exercise Exercise Program into Google, the first four uh, um, uh, hits will be the New Zealand manual on this, 
the uh, University of North Carolina uh, 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 Center for Training Therapists in the Otago. It's a basically a three-hour training program for 25 bucks run by um, a colleague who helped write our, our, our clinical guidance statement, uh, Tiffany Schubert, and she's training therapists and, and health professionals across the country in using the Otago program. Essentially, the Otago program was originally uh, uh, for community-dwelling, frail, older adult women, um, and, and this was done in the home because a lot of these folks with frailty, they don't have a lot of energy, they don't have a lot of um, incentive to go out and do stuff because they feel tired and they feel weak and they don't have a lot of mobility. So this is a program that goes over the course of the year that is simple home exercises with phone call and in-home home support. It's the kind of things that you and I have looked at for home exercise programs with cuff weights and balance. It's very simple to do, um, and uh, it's been very effective. 30% reduction in falls in this frail, at-risk, high-at-risk group. Um, so it's basically a number of visits, and we've had good results with it. There have been multiple studies now that have expanded it, but when we see those folks who want to work basically are frail and are probably going to stay mostly at home, this is probably the best program in existence across the, the, the global community right now. Um, and I'll show you where you can find more of that a little bit. Um, let's talk about intensity of training. The two big issues, and one of the reasons why those some of us in the academy uh, are now drafting and, and building a clinical practice guideline specific to physical therapy is that we don't have a clue on, uh, on what the best intensity of training is for people at different levels of risk. We can tell you what the best intensity based on ACSM and American Heart Association guidelines for older adults is for strengthening, and you'll see the slide next on what that is. But what is balance training in older adults? What the hell does that mean? Right? I mean, that's not an easy question. And what does it mean for somebody who's 72 who, who hasn't fallen um, or fallen once versus somebody who's 85 and falls every three or four days? What is balance training in those situations? We don't have good answers for that, but let me give you what we do have. Go ahead and the next slide, please. So here's the ACSM, American Heart Association Physical Activity Guidelines. So at a very basic level, when we're talking about building a lower extremity strengthening program for our, our, our patients, we should follow or start from this kind of, of place. And it's eight, it should be no surprise for people who understand moderate exercise. Eight to ten exercises performed on two to three non-consecutive days. For example, we know that, and one of the things that I did at UConn is we showed that if you give them five days of strength training, what are you going to do? You're going to hurt them. You're going to injure them. You're not going to help them any more than the three days a week if it's a properly dosed strengthening program. Um, if you're doing five days of strengthening and they're fine, you're underdosing them because properly dosed at five days is going to cause injury. So um, we know that if it's properly dosed um, and moderately high effort, you think about the Borg scale, right? That's in that 12 to 14 range in there, the readings of perceived exertion scale. And so we want to get the key lower extremity exercises, um, uh, particularly uh, uh, hip and ankle, um, and um, uh, do those on non-consecutive days. The aerobic stuff we know about too, right? We know the 30 minutes per day five times a week, or if we want to be vigorous, we know we can shut down the time a little bit and go three times per week. That's a lot of work, but there, there, there are plenty of folks that should be in that range for our, our, um, our prescriptions. Go ahead and move forward. Let's see about balance training. Go ahead and move that up now that we've talked that this is about balance. Here's we know what works. Leaning beyond the base of support and reaching in great directions, in greater amplitudes of directions. Shifting the center of mass, so getting lots of positioning of the mass near the edges of the base of support. Minimizing upper extremity support as you progress the training. Narrowing the base of support, challenging that foot placement. Changing the base of support by stepping. And Tai Chi is in there as well too. Um, so you're gonna look at that and you go, I came all the way out here for this. Um, uh, these are rather <laughs> obvious statements, right? This is kind of where we're at. We know what doesn't work, 
lack of balance training, lack of functional relevance, and lack of exercise progression. I can't emphasize that last point enough. We can't just give them one set of exercises and expect them to continue to do that and have them improve. We have to continually challenge them. Go ahead to the next slide. And this is a great paper that helps support this. This is a systematic review that was done in 2011. Um, and so it talks about the kinds of grading that we can do. A lot of this is going to be um, uh, obvious to you, but let me emphasize, most of this has to do with shifting the center of mass through changing the base of support. It means we have to get these folks stepping, we have to get them stepping in different directions and different magnitudes and um, onto and off of things, right? So we go into uh, other kinds of surfaces, we have them do different directions of stepping, we have them do more challenging sit to stand, we strengthen and do heel raises to challenge their balance and their base of support and we're having them stepping up and lateral as well to, um, to deal with that. So changing the step length and the step height as we go. These are the kinds of progressions we want to do. Go ahead. Um, so I tell my students when I teach balance uh, for older adults in, in the PT program, I put this slide up there. You can raise it up a little bit more. And these are the kinds of things that are obvious to the, the experienced clinician, but it's, this is where we're at, folks. You have to decide based on your assessment of balance, where they are with respect to this continuum of challenges. Can you, um, well, we really want them in standing. We don't gain a lot by sitting balance for fall. We know that. Uh, but that's, that's, uh, we, where are we with wide base of support to narrow base of support? Can they go from two, foot to one, uh, two feet to one foot? Should they be with eyes open and good lighting, or can we move them and progress them to, to, to poor lit uh, situations? When can we put them on the grass, or when can we put them uh, to walk over that mat with foam pieces underneath that makes it very unstable? And then um, having them moving objects outside or very uh, far away from their, uh, their center point. These are the kinds of progressions that we want to continue to do with our folks. And doing this at the level of the step, stepping sideways, forward, backwards, is probably the most important piece to our, our challenge. Now here's the thing, for those 85-year-old, frail, homebound little ladies, we get a lot by just changing the base of support and doing some static stuff. We know that even the static things for those lower level folks helps them out. So we want to look at grading this thing, but the more we challenge and the more we push them um, figuratively, uh, not literally, uh, we will be okay. I would like to talk about the, the, the perturbation studies. Um, there was a great systematic review within the last two months or three months in the PT Journal about perturbation work. Um, it's some of the stuff that I did at, at Northwestern. And um, there's a lot of things that are happening in that realm, but we, we need more data to talk about how we're pushing and pulling them. But we can do some of that for those higher level folks. Let's go on. Um, what is the frequency? Well, we need a, a minimum of twice per week. And we need um, uh, to uh, know that we can push them up to three times a week and even higher. But here's what happens. The higher in terms of frequency we go, the less adherence we get. So we have to balance. Um, uh, the amount of dosage with the amount of adherence we get from our folks. Next slide. How about time? This is the big one, and there's a magic number at the bottom, so go ahead, and we're not going to worry too much about that. Here's the thing that we know the most about from systematic reviews, and this is the, these are the magic numbers I want you to know. Um, what is the total volume? I just use the term duration. You can use volume, it's fine. What's the total duration of a, of a plan of care? in exercise and strength and balance training that we should have for our folks with, uh, who fall in the community. The, the, the systematic reviews put us between the 40 and 50 hour amount. That's the number we need to be targeting. If you are doing a, an outpatient PT program with somebody to try to, deep, to handle their fall problem and you've given them 12 to 14 hours of therapy and then send them on their way, that's not going to change anything. We know that that doesn't work. They've got to get up to this 40 to 50 hour mark. Um, community programs are oftentimes six months, three months, ten months, a year. Uh, Otago is a year-long program. Stepping on is multiple months of programming. So we need multiple months of continued programming in order to be successful with that. So 40 to 50 hours is the key variable there. And the mode, as I said before, it's got to be balanced and strengthening. When it comes to gait, this is an important point. 
we're, the reason we're doing gait training in these folks is to improve their stability during walking. It's not necessarily for brisk walking. And in fact, there have been a number, uh, there have been at least two studies that showed in postmenopausal women with fracture history, brisk walking increased their fall risk and increased their, their injury rates. So while brisk walking is good for aerobic training, um, in some populations of our more frail, older women, it's contributing to falls. So brisk walking for the reduction of falls is not, a, is not advised. In fact, we should focus on gait stability. And again, what, what does that mean? Simple thing as simple as turning their head when they're walking, looking up, looking down, doing some dual task kinds of things, doing conversations with people while they're walking in order to improve their stability when uh, their attention is directed away from them. And we also know that things like advice alone, so if you just give them some advice and tell them, you know, you really should do this, um, that's not going to work. Uh, we know that untargeted exercise, you know, the, the soup can sitting in, in the group therapy, right? That's not going to do anything. That's not specific. And um, modifications of the home environment alone, simply alone, without an exercise component, is probably not good enough. So we need, again, to target multifactorial uh, pieces. As far as adherence goes, here are some key features. Convenience of location is important. Um, social support and having a way to communicate and have a social outlet is important and helps with outcomes. Um, they need to have some uh, uh, ability to self-regulate the, the behavior change and to move through the sort of, I'm willing to do this, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to be successful at it. Um, and we know that there's a, a trade-off between the amount of exercise and the duration and the adherence. So again, as I said, the, we, we try to push them up a little bit further in multiple days for balance types of things, we generally lose adherence. So we want to find a, a balance uh, within uh, the amount of time that they're willing to spend. Uh, we'll, we'll skip over some of the environmental hazards and some of these other things. You may have heard uh, that there are a couple of studies that came out of Wisconsin a few years ago that foot and footwear problems can be uh, uh, helpful. We know that that exists. We also know that um, hip protectors don't help prevent falls, but they help prevent hip fractures. So, um, they, but people hate, hate them because they're cosmetically atrocious. So, um, let's look at some basic summaries real quick and then we'll, 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 we'll wrap this up. So, in summary, all older adults should be screened at least annually. Uh, we've talked about the screening mechanisms for that. If they produce a positive screen, multiple falls, or a fall with gait and balance problems, they need a multifactorial assessment that gets at, in our scope of practice, strength, balance, mobility, uh, general functioning, the feet, those kinds of things, and screening for those other systems. And interventions must be tailored towards the specific risk factors. They have to be evidence-based. We know that lower extremity strengthening is critical when added to a balance program, and that the balance program must be challenging and it must be progressive. Now, there are some problems with implementation of these evidence-based uh, um, uh, recommendations. So here are a few of them. <laughs> First and foremost, most people don't or aren't aware that the guidelines even exist. Um, that's, that's the first problem. There needs to be better access to guidelines. Um, we don't have uh, as much specifics of interventions. We don't know, for example, the best balanced treatment approach for the high versus the low risk when it comes to in, in or the moderate to the low risk in physical therapy care. We're presently working on that. Um, some of the toolkits, like the CDC study webpage, we don't have good data on its effectiveness. We find, right, that not all the physicians have adopted these kinds of practices. So physical therapists are primarily the people dealing with this sorts of things. The same thing with the PQRS system. Um, they're using the timed up and go to make decisions and to, and to manage that reimbursement. And now we have sufficient data to know that that's not really going to help us a whole lot. And we may be making the wrong decisions based on that information. Go ahead and keep going. Um, so these are the kinds of things that we're now worrying about and trying to deal with. So this is the biggest one, and this is the one that I would really encourage all of you in, in outpatient clinics to try to, to, to work on if you uh, haven't already done this, and that is how best to link referrals and knowledge between the clinical and the community settings. You know, now that we're, we've moved into a different sort of mindset for physical therapy, not one just always dealing with rehabilitation, but one with wellness and health promotion, how do we link what we're doing in the clinic 
to community uh, programming. Uh, we need a level of care that sort of deals with that sort of community program that, that we can help um, uh, you know, set up or be participative in so that we have um, programming that are for those low risk folks and that even for some of those moderate risk folks that we can start to um, uh, do some, um, some better work outside of the, well, I get, you know, I get four weeks with you and that's it. That's not enough, it's not gonna cut it. So uh, we have to have better programming and better uh, 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 procedures for that for the community. Um, reimbursement issues, uh, there's a, I could do a six hours on that. Um, <laughs> most effective providers to manage fall risk. Let's face it folks, it's gonna be us. Um, so uh, the physicians are lagging far behind except for the handful of geriatricians who really, really care about this. So it's, it's on us to try to be the leaders in this and uh, hopefully that will, will continue. Um, and what are the best ways to stratify risk and triage and to link interventions to risk factors? We have a long way to go to understand those best uh, practices for specific risk factors. Um, and how do we best engage the older adult? The greatest challenge for those at high risk is that many of them are frail and they don't have um, a, a lot of uh, ability to maintain and to continue with therapy because it's just so darn hard for them. And how do we deal with that? And so how do we get them engaged and how do we provide support systems in order for them to be successful that way? Last, just a plug, right? So um, the 23rd is Fall Prevention Awareness Day. There's a ton of information on the, the National Council on Aging. APTA, if you're getting their, their emails, they've got a whole bunch on their webpage for this. Next week, the 21st of Monday, starts a whole week of Fall Prevention Week. So do check out the National Council on Aging if, you're, if you want to do anything on that day specifically. CDC also has a lot of good posters and brochures and things for your folks. They're all free, and they can all be, um, you can put your name on and use them in your clinic. So if you want to even do that, you can do that. That's there. It's all free for everybody. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, so that was that was a lot in an hour and a half, or hour and 15 minutes or so. But um, I hope some of it was helpful to you. I hope uh, it, it, it triggered some interest or maybe fostered some questions. And I think we'll go ahead and we, we're going to take some questions. Do we have time for that?